you were speaking earlier, Matt, what it sounded to me is, is that pretty much exclusively the job here is to is to bring soldiers in as as the, as the, the developers. So so mostly do those people come from a you know previous life where they have some background in this, or are you taking people and you're you're growing them into software developers you know, from 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 scratch? It, it's a little bit of the former and a little bit of the latter. Um, it, it said that the army didn't have a, a true software development like career, but it, it did have a lot of, well, like I said before, uh, like, like IT related jobs, cyber related jobs. And, and there's a lot of overlap in, in the people in those jobs and the people who apply to, to come to the software factory. Uh, but it, it's not a hundred percent. Um, we've had people that, that are in other jobs, like, like aviation or medical or, you know, mechanics or, or whatever. Um, they often, you know, seem to have some type of, uh, an interest in software development, either yeah. before the army or, or after they joined, they, they nurtured that interest. And, and then this opportunity came along, uh, something interesting about the, the application process where, you know, the army has all these career fields and we really can't just take a bunch of people from like the IT career field. Like we can't deplete those to, to build this new capability. So we have to kind of be, uh, that balance where, where we're pulling all these folks from. Um, and, and, and so, so somebody who is maybe not, not necessarily IT background, uh, they, they have a, a slightly, uh, I would say higher chance, you know, depending on the, uh, the application period uh, of getting selected just because of the way that, that balance ends up working. Well, I, and, and I don't know whether this is a sensible question to ask or not, but, um, but. That suggests to me that you might you might have some kind of interesting selection criteria to choose these people to figure out who's got who's likely to be a good fit, who's likely to work out well. Uh, is there anything that you can talk about that? Um, I, I understand there are some things that we won't be able to talk about. Just say it, if at any point we touch on any of those. But yeah, um, no, I, I don't think anything about our our selection criteria is, is per se off, off the table. It's a uh, a fairly long process. Um, the, the army looks at the army software factory as, as basically like a, a broadening assignment. Like it's, it's managed like that right now. Um, so it, it broadening assignment, you know, basically means like it's, it's a, a spot to do something in your career that that's maybe like interesting to you, but not necessarily a core part of, of what your normal job is. Yeah. Um, so, so we, we put out a, a message army wide to, at least to, to the people who are are able to, uh, apply, uh, due to, you know, a bunch of different criteria about where they are in their career. And they, if they're interested, they also submit an application. Um, there, there's a resume review, uh, period. So there, we have a, a group of folks who uh, have come to, to kind of understand what makes a successful, uh, kind of tour through the army software factory. Um, and they, they look at, you know, indicators on the resume and that gets through the, the first part. So we, we go from about two to 300 applicants down to about a hundred there. Uh, and then they'll, they'll do, uh, interviews, uh, with folks and, and there's a, a coding aspect to it, you know, Hey, you know, how would you go about solving this? Um, some pseudocode, some actual coding, mm. uh, and, and there's also kind of a, a personality fit, uh, you know, aspect to the interviews. Uh, and, and once we have, uh, an order of merit list, uh, produced, then what we'll go into it's basically a negotiation phase with the different parts of the army that, that own these people, um, and, and say, Hey, you know, we'd like to, to have this person join our program for, you know, the next two years. Um, and, and yeah, every, every person's kind of, uh, application is, is a unique story to, to them and their career. Uh, but we get down to 25 folks, uh, every six months. So that's, that's what makes up the cohort. Cool. And. Do all of the people coming into one of these cohorts have some knowledge of coding or are you taking people and you teaching them coding as well? We do teach them coding. Um, it, some definitely come in, uh, but not all, uh, okay. Okay. So it, it's not a prerequisite. So, so, so the thing that's going through my head is that I can imagine viewers from, you know, a business context thinking. 
you know, we spend all of our time trying to recruit people with five years experience and all, all this kind of thing. And, and you guys are taking people with, in some cases, little or no coding experience, and then you're, you're getting them up to speed. So, so how have you found that? How, what are the challenges of that being? Cause I, I'm, I confess I'm kind of with you. I think that software, the, the, the growth of software developers works better as sort of a, an apprenticeship style thing than it does as, than it does as academic, uh, an academic discipline. But I, I think that's one of my heresies. So, so where do you stand on? Well, I, I think for what it's worth, I, I think it's absolutely fantastic. And some of the best results, um, in terms of of repeatable growth for these guys that I've, that I've ever seen in, in my career, um, and, and thankful for it. So what the, generally the high level is they'll come in, they'll go through kind of a, a, a boot camp like experience in association with the universe, uh, a university here in Austin, um, Austin Community College. And, um, so depending on what they're coming in as platform engineering or software development, right, they'll go through, um, a, a period of time where they are learning kind of the foundational concepts of whichever skill they're developing. Um, they'll step into what we've called a, a bridge program from there, where kind of the, the realities of the, what, what teams are working on, like on the floor at any given time are kind of brought into, to this bridge program along to meet the engineers along with that academic portion. So they start to see, okay, this is the, yeah, the thing that I learned and how it's being applied today. So kind of a practical bridging program. And then they go out onto, onto what we call it, the floor or the factory floor and, and they join a team. Um, the, the, what's really awesome is that when they join a team, they, uh, they, it's paired programming both for platform engineering and software development all the way through. So they're here, um, with the, with an industry expert, um, for, um, six months to a year. Um, and then just kind of from there, more senior folks on the teams will pair with them. Yeah. And so as those cohorts kind of rotate over every six months, right, you're, you're getting an opportunity to go through kind of that experience of being a, a junior dev to now kind of a, you know, a, a mid dev where you're, you're able to contribute and you're working more, more evenly as part of a pair and that. And then at some point you're going to get a turn as being the, the, the senior member in a pair, paired relationship, right? Yeah. I, I'm really said, I'm really pleased that you mentioned that about pair programming because, because, because my, my view is that that is the best way of bringing people and getting them up to speed. It's just such a fantastic way of people learning. Yeah. It, I, I, I think that it really enables, it, it enables the, right, the work that we're doing here at Software Factory and, and trying to, trying to to talk about software development as a capability for for the army right like that's that's a moving target right now there's a lot of change happening in the industry all the time um and and through that kind of paired programming experience we can stay focused yeah on high level hey this is what the capability can do yeah. um but from an like the thing the technologies that we're utilizing we don't have to be super religious about an, an individual tech stack Right now, our, our platform, for example, is a Kubernetes-based platform. So everyone, like platform engineers, get the opportunity to to learn Kubernetes and how to help software deploy and be hosted on, on a Kubernetes-based platform, right? Yeah. Uh, but it, if we ever needed to uh, change out how we are we are working, whether it's the platform or whether it's the the tools and our, and programming language for the application team, where we have a paired program paired program paradigm so we can switch those out relatively easily in, in the sense that yeah we're, we're going to have kind of a built-in method for for upscaling or bringing everyone else along on those technical changes yeah so 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 one of the things that we haven't really talked about yet and you know once again i, I completely understand if some of this stuff you can't talk about but but, but the nature of the software that you're building, what, what kinds of systems are you creating and what kinds of problems are you solving? And you, you've already said, Jeff, that this is kind of a new moving feast and, and, you know, it's changing all of the time, completely understand, but just paint a picture. So we've got, even if, even if you're not talking about real systems, but the kind of systems that you're building. So we've got a, a bit of a mental model of what that's like. 
would be great. Yeah. Um, so they, there are lots of examples. We, we built uh, a bunch of, uh, you know, apps already. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll give some examples. Uh, so we've got a, an application for, uh, called Blast Radius. Um, and, and it's, it's designed to, to plan ammo handling uh, uh, points. So w w when the army goes somewhere, like we, we put all the ammo in like kind of a consolidated place and there's lots of rules about where that place could be, how the ammo has to be stored. And a lot of those rules are, are kind of ripe for automation. Uh, in, in the past, before the app, a, a lot of folks would, would kind of handle this manually. Um, they, they would have spreadsheets with like different rules and calculations built in, but it was a little error prone. Um, and, and it, it could lead to, to pretty bad results to, you know, kind of worst case scenarios. Um, so it, it was, it was right for automation and centralization. Um, so that's, that's now basically a, a web app that, that folks can, can go to, they, they log in through like a centralized army login, uh, service that was already available. And then they can plan their, their ammo handling sites a lot more quickly. Uh, it's actually taught in the schoolhouse now, um, for, for, for the folks that, uh, that do that job, uh, from basically how to use this app. Um, they still have to learn the manual process and the reasons behind the rules. Yeah. Uh, but it, it does make the, the job easier for them in, in a lot of ways. Uh, are these, is, is, is that, that one in particular, is, is that the kind of tool that you could, that you would use in the field? So it, it is the kind of tool that, that we would use in the field, uh, so that the army has to, to move around a lot and the, those ammo handling points yeah. need to, to be picked up and moved and replanned. Um, so the, it, there's like distances from, from, you know, like, like inhabited spaces that need to be calculated, stuff like that. Uh, th there's also, um, more tactical, uh, applications, um, where like, like the soldiers have devices on them these days that, are, that like kind of share their location on a map and, and let them chat with others. Uh, we build plugins for, for those devices uh, so that, that they can, you know, send like, like pretty formatted reports and, and consolidate that information instead of just kind of sending all their information free text. So it, it speeds up, uh, like situational awareness on the battlefield. Yeah. Uh, but, but we do build stuff that I, I, I would say is more, uh, like like on on the other end of 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 that like like those are are tactical I guess but but there's there's problems that that you know organizations have the, the army's large you know bureaucracy and then the the sub commands under it are, are still pretty large pretty unwieldy and they have a lot of like manual processes that are also ripe for for some type of automation and and those are are, are definitely things that that we do um, we, we've built an app that uh that attracts uh, it, it jump status, uh, for, for folks. So the, the army has, uh, an airborne, uh, the, a set of people, people who jump out of the planes with parachutes and there's a lot of safety regulations around that. Um, or like they need to get so many jumps, uh, in, in a certain amount of time, they need to have training. Uh, and, and there's, there's just a whole lot of planning, like logistical planning that, that goes into that. Uh, it, it also affects soldiers pay. Like if they're on jump status, they, they get paid more. Um, so. We, we've written an app that uh, allows that to be centralized, centrally managed. And, uh, you know, as a, a former airborne soldier myself who, you know, tracked all this on paper, like I can tell you, I've had to recreate my jump log from scratch. So, so seeing this finally be automated was, was, you know, kind of soothing to, to me. <laughs> this clip was taken from my podcast, The Engineering Room with Dave Farley a monthly podcast with some of the brightest minds in software engineering. You can find full episodes on all your favourite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Amazon Music. Your support helps us to bring the, you these regular episodes, so please leave your positive review on your preferred podcast platform to help us to continue to grow and bring you great guests and their insights. Thank you very much for listening.